Good evening and uh, welcome to the first webinar in the KCLA Centenary Conversations Illuminating COVID-19. My name is Barry Morgan and I have the privilege to be chair of KCLA in this, our centenary year. To celebrate, we've been planning to hold a series of conversations on a range of subjects of topical interest. However, COVID intervened and the subject chose itself, along with the need to stream the series rather than to hold live events on campus. Please excuse any technical glitches. This is a first in 100 years. If you are disconnected, you will be able to reconnect. We want to illuminate COVID-19 and its impact from a range of perspectives across all the faculties of King's. However, we start with a medical focus. What have we learned about the virus and its treatment over the last six months? I will now hand over to the chair for the evening, Professor Sir Robert Leckler, who retired last month as Senior Vice President Provost Health to explain the structure of the webinar and to introduce the speakers. Robert. Thank you very much, uh, Barry. And can I add my welcome to uh, all the alumni that are online? It's great that you've been able to join us for what I think promises to be a very interesting session. So the way we're going to run this, uh, we've got two uh, speakers who are going to share their perspectives on this pandemic, and I'll come to them in a moment. They're each going to speak for a maximum of 20 minutes, uh, and then we'll have an open discussion. Uh, we're inviting you, if you want to pose a question, to use the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of the screen, and I'll try to keep an eye out for your questions as well as perhaps uh, posing some of my own. I think if you can keep your microphones muted um, when you're not speaking, that's always uh, a very helpful move on these Zoom calls. So very briefly by way of introduction, it's a very nice opportunity for me to acknowledge the extraordinary performance of all the partners of King's Health Partners during this pandemic. It's been really remarkable and very impressive in every dimension. This is in terms of all the clinical staff uh, and across the university, many of the clinical academics have returned pretty much full time to the coalface to help with the clinical load. But also there's been an extraordinary research performance straddling a very, very wide spectrum from basic me mechanistic understanding to novel therapies, to mental health research, to epidemiology. And you're going to hear about some of that this evening. So without further ado, let me um, turn to the first of our speakers, uh, Dr. Claire Steves, who is a uh, senior lecturer in the university and has an honorary consultant geriatrician post in Guy's and St. Thomas's. And Claire has a long-standing interest in frailty in the elderly um, and also uh, has been making uh, very intelligent use of a wonderful set of twins um, that Tim Spector and colleagues have assembled um, across our patch. And of course, in the context of COVID, she's turned her attention uh, to COVID and I'm sure she's going to shed some light on why one of the biggest risk factors for serious disease is age. Um, so Claire, uh, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. So hopefully there's no technical glitches with that. Um, so um, hopefully you can see a little bit of a screen. Wait, wait a second, it's coming. Um, so yes, um, I'm going to tell you about some insights that we've got around COVID from four million citizen scientists in the UK that have joined in in a big endeavour called the COVID Symptom Study app, um, which we developed back in March and quickly launched just at the time of lockdown coming into place. Um, and um, the background, I guess, for this is that we developed this initially um, to look at how coronavirus was playing out within our population of twins that we've been studying for 25 years from King's College London. And as Robert pointed out, um, uh, we've had many insights in terms of genetics, in terms of epidemiology um, in, uh, that we've developed over the years, in particular in, in aging. And we felt that because coronavirus was such a, a disease that affected older people, it'd be really good to really understand the experience of that 
within the twin. So we developed um, what then became the COVID symptom study app. But very quickly, we realized, of course, that um, it didn't need to only be constrained to be within Twins UK and that we could launch it across the UK population. And we were very interested to see how that could then be a tool to help understand the epidemiology of COVID. Um, so um, ov obviously um, you'll hear a lot more from um, uh, Dr. Abs about um, the huge clinical, um, massive clinical effort that went in in GSTT and KCL um, into um, studying, uh, into treating COVID. As clinical epidemiologists, we really wanted to play our part. But I also, as a geriatrician, actually work um, uh, within a care home that was hit by um, coronavirus. And so with that, I gained quite quickly an insight into how coronavirus might present, both in patients and in nursing staff, which was then to, uh, we were able to use that insight into the development of the app originally. And then I guess um, it, it could spiral into a big phenomenon, partly because of the really great media relations that Tim Spector, as many of you will know, already had, um, which allowed us to get a platform to discuss our app and put it out there to the British public, who were really thirsty for answers in terms of understanding coronavirus at that time when the, um, the peak was just about to begin. And thirdly, of course, it was really important that we had a technological company um, by our side, um, who was willing to do a not-for-profit initiative to investigate this. And that was Zoe, um, uh, a health science company that has been uh, working with us in some of our uh, other work in epidemiology for some years. So hence, the lab app was launched. And if you um, are not familiar with it, please become familiar with it, because actually, as we enter the next wave, um, it's going to continue to be really important impartial uh, 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 set of evidence that we can understand how the disease is moving through our population. It takes only about a minute, less than a minute a day, um, once you've logged in originally to sort of just put in some basic characteristics about you. And you can log for yourself and you can also log for other people, um, provided they've given you consent, um, if they are adults, and provided you are the person that can consent for them if they're children. Um, so um, since we launched on 24th of March, we've now got 4.1 million users across the United Kingdom and about 400,000 of those are reporting for more than one person. So that's quite important in terms of some of the understanding about aging um, and the effect in older people of coronavirus. And right at the beginning, as you may remember, testing was not very well available um, throughout the UK, especially if you were not healthcare workers or admitted to hospital. Um, however, using the something like uh, it's something like a hundred thousand now uh, individuals who are healthcare workers who are on the app, who were having tests, we could work out what were the symptoms that were associated with a positive test and what were symptoms associated with a negative test. And using this, we created a predictive algorithm that could tell us take us from symptoms to a prediction as to whether they were likely to have coronavirus. And of course. That's not necessarily useful at an individual level, but across a population, it's really powerful in terms of mapping how the disease is changing through that population and continues to be so, as there are problems sometimes in testing, as we've seen in the last few weeks. Um, so using that and also using the information on uh, many tests that people have then since put into the app, we were able to understand about clusters of symptoms and personal characteristics that gave you increased risk um, and also, together with the Department of Health and Social Care, we've done a collaborative project where since May, we've actually been offering everybody who is on the app, um, who has new symptoms that have developed in the last week or so, they are then invited to come to a test, and then, e even if they don't have core symptoms, and then that then helps to feed in to our understanding and our ability to report across um, the UK. We've been feeding directly into NHS. I'll tell you a bit more about that. Um, and we've been particularly, they're particularly interested in our hotspots. I'll show you a little bit about that. And of course, because this is all real time, we can perform real time research on risk factors of coronavirus. Um, so we've been um, informing the public and obviously one of the key things about such a, a big citizen science um, movement is to make sure that we feed back results as quickly as possible to the people that are uh, putting all the effort in on a daily basis. 
basis. So we've um, been very um, uh, forthright in putting all our research up onto blogs that are easily digestible on the app, on the, um, app website, which is, as I've put there, www.covid.joinzoe.com. But we've been influencing policymakers as well, feeding directly up to Sage and Patrick Valance, feeding directly into the Department of Health and Social Care, who we meet on a weekly basis, and being there and at the table informing the decisions about how the Office of National Statistics do their new wave of um, a larger study um, uh, of coronavirus over the UK. And we've had several studies that have actually been commissioned by NHSX and so on. Um, we're now contributing to um, the research community in several ways. First of all, we are using our, um, uh, well, our volunteers, um, if they say they are interested, are able to be put forward for vaccine trials. So that's a recruiting pool which allows us to quickly recruit um, individuals. Also to other st studies such as vitamin studies um, and aiding in trial design. So, um, for example, some groups who are really interested in maybe exposure, exposing young individuals to coronavirus and seeing uh, whether or not vaccines may um, affect in that sense, we can help in the planning and the ethics that goes behind that by explaining how coronavirus actually um, presents in young adults that they might be using for such a trial. Um, and we've also been, right from quite early in the pandemic, been involved in recruiting people for plasma donation. Our data is made available to researchers across uh, the UK um, using uh, the Health Data Gateway, which is at um, Swansea. And anybody who is a bona fide researcher can apply for that data. Um, although, of course, you'll need a bit more than an Excel spreadsheet to manage this data. It is a very large data set, um, and we also give some software tools, but um, analysts would need to be familiar with Python or R, certainly, to be able to analyze the data. Um, so research outputs to date, I, I'm going to talk about a few of them that I've put in bold here. One of them is really a, a gaining recognition that anosmia was a key symptom of coronavirus, which many of you will already um, uh, have known if you were working clinically at the beginning, but it was really important to get that um, into the public domain so that people could um, uh, uh, know about that um, and it could become one of the core symptoms. And it was just a couple of days after our paper was published in Nature Medicine that we managed to uh, get that in the UK. So that's a big impact really um, uh, for our work. Delirium as well, I'll tell you a bit more about that. Um, there are many others though as well. In, in particular, people can present with skin rashes. Um, you'll know about the increased risk of coronavirus in people who are overweight. Um, smoking is something else that we've also published on. It's not so much your increased risk of coronavirus, but actually if you do are a smoker, you're more likely to get more severe disease. Um, but we've published on other things as well. Um, uh, and in terms of biology, we've had a really fruitful relationship with the Department of Infection and Immunology in doing um, an immunology test on the twins who are also part of the app. And that's been really good in understanding how antibody development is related to symptoms as we've been able to um, map symptoms over time in this population. So um, these are two of the early papers that we put out. One of them, the top one in science, really showing how this mobile technology could be used for real-time epidemiology and looking at, uh, this was one of the earlier papers, looking at how we could detect um, hotspots with this sort of data. And the second one was around the Nature Medicine paper around anosmia. And I'm just going to show you here what we mean by this. So, so this is a graph which is showing the odds ratio. So the risk, in it, as it were, um, if you have a symptom of getting a positive test as opposed to a negative test if in the tested population. And you can see here that we saw very, very clear signal that um, the, the, the symptom that was related to um, having a positive test um, was um, uh, loss of smell. And this is in the sort of 18 to 69 age group in particular. Um, and of course, that's the, the, the majority of people that are moving around circulating and will need to circulate um, uh, if we're going to keep our economy live. So it's really important that we know about that. Um, but here, um, it, funny enough, in the care home, the, the nursing staff were losing their sense of smell, but the patients were skipping meals. And that was a, a, you know, a very clear sort of sign, well, it, you know, that that, that, that things were, were, were perhaps going wrong, even though they didn't have core symptoms. And indeed, the, the research bears that out as well, that, that those skipping meals and fatigue were, were key 
um, indicators and are still not core symptoms, of course, um, because they may occur in other illnesses. Um, uh, we, it, using this algorithm, we were able to show is to have pretty good prediction of whether or not someone had um, coronavirus, provided they were in that age group categorization I said. A um, little bit about hotspots. This is really early in the disease, uh, in, the, in the pandemic um, in London, and I'll show you um, some, some more later. Um, but we could see how um, certain hotspots, London, Birmingham, really were um, the, the, the sort of epicenters of disease. And I'm sure that's why um, uh, um, Dr. Ian Abbs will be able to tell you so much, because really St. Thomas's Hospital was actually really the centre of the epicentre. Um, but using this data as well, we can look at, and we were the first to actually um, publish on um, the relationship between um, coronavirus and areas of deprivation, showing very clearly that in uh, areas of high deprivation, we're much more likely to have a much greater burden of coronavirus. And that is still the case um, now. Um, so here, this is, um, I've just um, uh, copied for you here, some of the daily updates that we give to um, uh, the Department of Health, and it go, even goes to the Cabinet Office. Um, and these were from last week, so I think I, d I did this on something like Friday. Um, I'm sorry, it's not yesterday's. Um, so here shows um, a map of where the, si where the positive cases are that we, ke we get at the moment within our um, data set. And you can see there's a, a large conglomeration around London and so on. But just wanted to show you this. So this is over time. Um, uh, you know, before this is from the, since the time that we've been able to get testing data on a daily basis on individuals who are newly sick. Um, and you could see that from May, um, we saw things dr dropping from having been really right up here in, in um, early April. And then through the summer, things were fine. This is the new curve that we're getting. And you can see that just a, a, a couple of weeks ago, it looked like things were tailing off, but a little bit oddly, because it's not a very clear curve. And, a, and of course, then that's based on testing. This graph, however, is based just, on, based just on symptoms. And you can see that in every area, but particularly the northwest and northeast, there is no such dropping off here. And this is probably due to the different the difficulties in getting tests meant that actually our figures from the last few weeks have probably been um, underestimates. But the reality is that the pandemic has been going on, luckily beginning to become less exponential. We still see um, now that there's a very disproportionate effect on lower socioeconomic classes to higher socioeconomic classes. And here are some of the watch lists. This is the, the daily information that we feed through um, showing um, the areas which are, um, my uh, vi video is in the wrong place, but the areas which on this particular day were um, trending um, over the past week as being uh, areas of, of particular interest. So Newcastle upon time topping the list uh, with an increasing trend, but you can see Oldham staying stable so that the dot is staying stable and Glasgow City starting to go down. So I think this is quite useful data. We're going to be updating it and keeping it going. We're really interested in how we could model other things such as dispersion of the virus, as you know, with super spreaders, that being a, a particularly big issue. Um, so I'm hoping to be able to go to my next slide. Race, I just wanted to mention race again because the, the sort of Black Lives Matter um, uh, um, uh, sort of energy has a little bit gone away. We really need to understand and get to the root of, of, um, uh, of why uh, coronavirus really affected um, people of non-white ethnicity. And here I just want to show you, this is kind of difficult graph, I do uh, recognize that. Um, but what I want to show you here is that um, particularly here in the UK, less so in the US, because we had less good socioeconomic data in the US. But in the UK, you see that there's an increased risk um, with um, uh, people who describe themselves as coming from black ethnic origin. Um, and when you account for socioeconomic factors, comorbidities, um, uh, the, the ability of a person to isolate by their self-report, you see that risk reducing down to zero, which means that the risk that is involved in ethnicity is not a biological one, it is very much a one about society. And that's something that we really need to change, both within the NHS and within the whole of the um, of society, as we know, um, there's much more work to do there. Um, uh, so thanks to Robert for talking about uh, older people, because 
because um, uh, here I'm going to go on to how um, coronavirus uh, presents, as you know, very differently in some people. Some people get a, even an asymptomatic disease and some people get very severely ill and go and see Ian and his amazing team of doctors. Um, so who might these be? This is a study that we've, um, we, we've still got under review, but we're really excited about it because we find that at just five days, we can detect who's going to, to um, get sick and need hospitalization, in particular need respiratory support, um, from their symptoms and their baseline characteristics. And the reason why is like this. So um, when we do a machine learning model to all the symptoms that someone is presenting with, uh, or a set of people are presenting with who have a positive test, we see that they divide into different presentations. Some people get a much more um, uh, flu-like illness, even without a fever. Some people get one with a fever. Some people, though, in this third cluster, tend to get um, uh, diarrhea and abdominal pain coming in, a little bit more abdominal symptoms, skip meals being very key. Um, but then there are people in these higher clusters which have many, many more symptoms, and it's those people that have the most high risk. It's also those people that, have, that, that are frailer um, uh, and are more likely then to die of the illness. So we think this is going to be really important as we face the next wave, that if we can understand the symptoms right early on, we might be able to put preventive measures, potentially treatment measures, um, at the home stage um, and also better monitoring with pulse oximetry, so me me measuring the oxygen levels of people in the home so that next time, th this coming wave, as it, they don't present to hospital at 13 days, which was the average from within our data set. Um, they present much earlier and get the treatment they need at the time they need. And you don't need a magic model for this. It's just we can create a model which is highly predictive just using the number of symptoms in the first week and age and BMI. And they predict not only severity, but also long COVID, which is becoming an increasingly worrying thing. Um, so um, we're actually really pleased that on Friday, um, the um, Public Health England changed their advice around uh, guidance about um, predict, uh, testing for COVID in older people and introduced um, the fact that if, if someone had new confusion or delirium, then that could be a trigger for a test. And this is based on the paper that we published last week in Age and Aging, showing that delirium is a key feature in people who are positive for coronavirus, especially if they are frail. Um, and um, so an acute confusion that is new obviously could be something that's related to um, other illnesses as well, um, but should be something that prompts a test. So I'm nearly there. I just wanted to tell you about um, some new features coming soon, because if you've been on the app before and you're, um, you, you've sort of lost the, the interest in it, we've got some new features that are coming that might be really helpful for you. Um, and that also then allows you to contribute to this scientific effort. Um, one of them is about trends in your local area. The other thing relevant to King's College London is we uh, are wanting to be able to give universities university level feedback. Um, and the second thing is that we want to give back health information specific to you. Um, so, for example, um, uh, advice which comes from our collaborations with Royal College of General Practitioners and Health Education England on uh, situations if you have comorbidities or indeed if you have early symptoms across many different um, uh, organ systems in those first five days um, of your illness, if you sh should get coronavirus. Um, future directions obviously is highly dependent on funding, and we are funded by the Department of Health and Social Care, or at least Zoe, the company, um, is being funded by, by them to be able to produce these statistics, which are, are useful um, and, uh, and helpful in hotspot prediction. Um, but also we've gained crowdsource funding from people that are on the app, and that's been really essential. We've, ju we've just um, uh, put in some formal peer reviews to be able to use that money to create a research platform to take forward our recruiting to research trials, supporting intervention studies and supplying that personalised feedback. And also a biobank um, for us to look at the biology behind long COVID, which we think that we're particularly well placed to research. And indeed, there's going to be a paper coming out on that next week. Um, so we've had a lot of help from charities 
um, to really help push um, uh, the, the app into, into um, many sectors. And we're very grateful for their support. And of course, a really huge team actually across um, uh, KCL in particular from the data science team um, run uh, by Seb Orsalan, but also at, at in the States in, um, uh, in Sweden and um, the Zoe team of analytics. There's that link again, in case you want to have a look at our data. Um, thank you very much. Claire, thank you very much indeed. Uh, really fascinating stuff. So if you could unshare your screen and then we can get um, uh, the next set of slides up while I'm just introducing uh, our next speaker. We won't take questions now. We'll, take, uh, we'll have some discussion after Ian's finished. So, so it's a great pleasure to introduce Ian, who's been a friend and a colleague for, for many years. Like many of the best people, his background is as a, a kidney physician and transplant physician in particular. Uh, and he now is the chief executive uh, of one of the country's uh, leading and best NHS Foundation trusts, uh, Guy's and St. Thomas's. And as I mentioned, and then Claire reinforced, uh, Guy's and St. Thomas's and KCH really were at the epicenter of this pandemic. And uh, put in a fantastic shift uh, in coping with an enormous and very acute burden of illness. So Ian's going to tell us how they did that um, and how it is now. Ian, over to you. Uh, Robert, thank you very much. Uh, uh, and Barry uh, and colleagues, what a fantastic opportunity to talk to uh, KCL alumni this evening. I count myself as one, uh, and uh, so it's a great pleasure and an honor to talk this evening. Um, Barry is going to share my slides, um, uh, and I'm going to give you a flavor, um, building on the brilliant talk from Claire, um, uh, of some of the experience of our hospitals um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, but then focus on perhaps some of the lessons that we've learned. But I think experience um, uh, is a powerful tool for learning and we've learned a lot over the last uh, six months. Uh, next slide, please, Barry. So um, focus on a couple of points on, on this slide. Um, really, we started to see our first patients towards the end of February, um, uh, and then increasing numbers of patients coming uh, to Guy's and St. Thomas's and also King's College Hospital um, over the next few weeks and months. South London particularly uh, was significantly affected um, in the first wave of COVID-19. So uh, as Robert pointed out, we really were on the front line. Uh, we saw uh, large numbers um, of patients around uh, over 1,600 patients um, over the uh, period were admitted to Guy and St. Thomas's. Um, and importantly, um, a number of those uh, developed a lung failure um, and were cared for um, in our critical care beds. Now, to put it in context, we would normally have something like 50 to 60 uh, critical care beds, um, uh, but we increased uh, our number of beds uh, and at one stage had over 120, uh, and for much of the time, over 100 patients in critical care. Um, importantly, um, uh, we had um, uh, uh, a number of patients, so about 57 over the period of care, uh, who were looked after um, on ECMO, which is uh, extra corporeal membrane oxygenation. It's a very sophisticated technique to remove the blood when the lungs have completely failed. Um, and we looked after significant numbers um, uh, of patients. And what's very interesting, and perhaps a feature of this disease compared to other types of pulmonary infection, uh, is our overall survival rate uh, for patients in critical care was about 72% versus the national average of about 58%. So we did see with the clinical science based on uh, colleagues from the university and the hospitals, excellent survival um, in our patients. But also, we saw a very similar number, um, around 71% surviving ECMO, which is extraordinary, really, uh, when you reflect that that is actually the uh, total control of lung function by machine technology. So that's something we've really learned during the COVID 
pandemic. Um, of those um, 1650 patients that we had in, very sadly, 232 patients died uh, with some of the risk factors that Claire talked particularly about earlier. But I have to say, you know, um, I'm very pleased that over 1400 patients actually left hospital to return to their loved ones. Next slide, please. Um, the, um, where are we now? Um, you'll have seen uh, much in the press recently about the differential risks of both treating patients during uh, with COVID, but also treating patients with other types of illness um, uh, that have their own risks, their own morbidity and mortality. And certainly there's good data now um, looking out over time uh, where we are concerned uh, that the uh, longer term impact of the COVID-19 pandemic will be as much in uh, patients with non-COVID type illnesses like cancer and heart disease. And we are thinking very actively about how to do that. Uh, we've certainly um, increased our capacity, but despite that, because of the uh, close attention we're paying to um, risk reduction uh, from infection, uh, we're still not yet to our uh, pre-COVID-19 levels of activity and working out how to work during the COVID-19 pandemic is going to be very um, important. Uh, we've certainly been uh, with our university colleagues looking at training programs um, and uh, new approaches uh, to the care of patients with COVID-19, but we still have much to learn. Um, next slide, please. Um, uh, the KHP perspective, uh, King's Health Partners, as you know, is one of the largest academic uh, uh, science centres in the UK. Um, over uh, 40,000 staff um, uh, and two very large um, uh, NHS tertiary uh, hospitals. So uh, we've had a particular experience within KHP organisations. Um, across our organisations, um, over 3,000 uh, patients treated uh, and over, uh, in aggregate, 500 people in intensive care. Um, uh, on the GSTT site, um, we uh, like learn quite early, um, as we are uh, one of the few uh, UK high consequence infectious diseases units, uh, where uh, when the first patients with um, uh, COVID-19 were coming in, we were caring for those patients in the equivalent of spacesuits. But as changes in understanding the virus and changes in numbers happen, one of the interesting um, things that we've had to deal with psychologically is actually um, the extent to which our staff um, understand how to look after patients safely uh, going from uh, the equivalent of spacesuits to what you might see on the wards now, which are essentially masks, gowns and gloves. And that has quite a psychological um, impact. Um, we've been active um, in uh, research, um, uh, particularly with uh, the REM Desivar trial, uh, you'll have heard about that in the context of um, President Trump, um, who received Remdesivir um, uh, in Washington recently. Um, we've, um, uh, Claire talked a little bit about um, data analytics. We've been very active using um, a locally developed analytics tool, Cogstat, uh, for real-time analysis, which really has given us insights into issues such as the impact of ethnicity in severe COVID infection outcome. Uh, and from the university, more than 200 clinical academic uh, fellows, other colleagues in the university have been deployed um, from KCL um, into the NHS Trust, as well as using much of KCL space um, for um, uh, testing for COVID-19 uh, and also for the development of new technologies such as lateral flow uh, antibody testing. So really we have been one of the very first organizations working in collaboration with the university um, to uh, educate the country on the impact of COVID-19. Next slide, please. Um, uh, it's interesting though to reflect, um, and this um, picture is from the 1918 pandemic, um, uh, how much we still have to learn. Uh, and those lessons learned, I think, to be honest, I think we've been a little bit slow picking up some of those lessons from 1918. 
um, uh, uh, till today. Um, and on the next slide, um, Barry, um, uh, I think the what we have learned um, uh, is that the care of these complex patients does require um, a very close collaboration between different specialties. And, and certainly uh, we saw at the time of the COVID-19 pandemic um, a, a real increase um, uh, in collaboration um, and uh, in uh, the care of patients, particularly from uh, areas such as infectious diseases. Um, we had to uh, retrain uh, a number of our staff. Uh, and one issue for us, I think, in the future, we may get into this in discussion, um, uh, is how we approach training um, of clinical staff, uh, perhaps away um, from some of the um, ultra-specialized training, uh, but ensuring that staff do maintain their general skills, um, uh, which were absolutely to the fore um, in looking after the large numbers of patients with COVID-19. Uh, next slide, please, Barry. Uh, this is one um, example of change. This actually is a pediatric um, intensive care unit, uh, but it's been kitted out for adults. Um, so we uh, moved um, patients from uh, our pediatric critical care unit, and there was a massive engineering effort um, to repurpose that critical care area uh, that we normally see babies and very young children um, into a unit for adults. And we use this extensively uh, for adults during the pandemic. But it shows, as well as the clinical changes, uh, the infrastructure changes that we need to put in place uh, during COVID-19. Next slide, please. Um, I think the other thing uh, that we learned was around um, uh, collaboration across um, organisations in South East London, um, out of Guy and St. Thomas's and KCH, uh, we were able to uh, organise a network of care uh, for patients with the severest manifestations of COVID-19. Um, and we were uh, at one stage transferring in patients by, via a specialised uh, transport system, specialised ambulance, capable of looking after the sickest of patients as we transferred them in from outer London uh, and even into Kent, uh, Sussex and Surrey. Um, we focused particularly um, on respiratory care and develop new pathways for uh, respiratory failure and respiratory care. And one thing which was a very um, important part of the COVID-19 uh, experience was le learning about thrombosis um, and uh, the consequences for the clotting uh, system are profound, uh, not only um, in terms of local thrombosis in response to inflammation, uh, but also um, in pulmonary emboli. Uh, and we've learned a lot already uh, about how to treat the second wave uh, of COVID by early um, uh, treatment of thrombosis risk. And that has been really led by colleagues um, at Guy's and St. Thomas's and at KCH um, uh, for national uh, learning. Uh, and uh, there's a recent uh, play uh, that's called some of those things out, focusing on the work of Professor Beverly Hunt uh, from here. Uh, we learned a lot about the renal injury associated with COVID. That was one issue um, uh, to um, uh, think about. And certainly we, see more, we saw more renal failure um, in the early stages. We've got better approaches down to volume management uh, to prevent that. And I certainly um, learned a lot um, uh, on that last bullet point there about how to manage a very important um, uh, prime minister um, during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, which has some interesting lessons for me um, of their own. So next slide, please, Barry. Uh, and this summarizes, I won't um, go through the detail, um, but this is the summary slide um, uh, from uh, our experience of COVID-19 in the first wave. So, uh, we've learned, for example, that fluid management is very important in the uh, prevention um, of uh, renal injury and the prevention of renal failure. During the early phase, uh, we've learned how to manage better the acute respiratory 
um, uh, failure uh, seen early in SARS-19 um, uh, uh, infection. Um, we are now um, uh, giving remdesivir, as was given to uh, the president in the US, uh, for patients requiring oxygen. And that does appear uh, to be beneficial. Um, we learned um, through some of the studies, um, very active uh, research recruitment into uh, a number of studies involving corticosteroids. And that's where the evidence for early use of dexamethasone came in. Um, and again, dexamethasone uh, used in President Trump. That's the reason uh, it was used uh, in terms of changing, modulating the inflammatory response, which is a key component of uh, those patients that go on to severe illness. Um, uh, there's a, 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 an inflammatory response with activation um, of immune uh, cells uh, and molecules, which themselves um, cause significant inflammation and damage within uh, multiple organs, uh, often associated then with the multi-organ failure uh, seen in patients in critical care. Um, and we certainly learned a lot um, about the requirement for um, uh, prophylaxis against thrombosis, both for um, deep vein um, uh, thrombosis, but also uh, for that localized inflammatory thrombosis. Uh, so this now um, is the standard of care um, for patients with um, uh, COVID-19 that we're seeing now. And we are seeing, we think, um, uh, an improvement in the a reduction in the number of patients requiring uh, critical care who might have required it in the first phase. Next slide, please. Um, some other um, learning, I'll pick out a couple of things. Um, uh, we, uh, you may have seen um, uh, some of the publicity around for patients um, in critical care uh, and actually on our wards, very difficult for them to uh, communicate with their families. Uh, and so we developed um, through colleagues in the critical care here, uh, Joel Meyer and colleagues um, uh, in association with KCL uh, lifelines, which allows uh, using uh, technology such as iPads, uh, the sickest of patients to communicate um, with their uh, loved ones uh, and actually, uh, in some cases, to have poignant conversations at the end of life. Um, uh, I won't dwell on um, other points on this slide, Barry, but uh, I'm happy to take questions on this. Next slide. Um, I learned some important lessons um, uh, around how to lead during um, uh, uh, a crisis. Um, and really our job, um, certainly in leadership, um, is uh, not, uh, as the slide on the left um, distinguishes, um, to drive from the top. It's actually uh, in an organization, uh, a clinical organization, very important to support from the bottom, really to support the, um, uh, the clinicians um, to take uh, their learning uh, and help them uh, develop those into the new treatments uh, that uh, Claire and others was, were talking about, um, such that we really focus on that front line. Um, and really, the rest of the organization is there to support. Um, so, um, uh, I don't know, Barry, if that was the last slide, um, or that was a time um, uh, question, but um, I'm very happy to uh, just finish on uh, a couple of points without slides. Um, I mean, very important um, uh, lesson that the only way to uh, respond to the COVID-19 pandemic is through collaboration, uh, collaboration between the university um, and the health system, uh, collaboration between clinicians and scientists uh, and uh, collaboration as an organization. But on, on there, I'll, Barry, I'll stop. Um, I'm very happy to take questions. Ian, thank you very much indeed. So thank you both, actually, for pretty well sticking to time. So we've got uh, at least 15 minutes left now for discussion. And I would invite you, if you have a, a question you'd particularly like to pose, to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and I'll try and pick those questions up and maybe maybe I could start uh, with a question I, I guess I'm really directing towards Claire because I mean, the, the most prominent risk factor for severe disease is age 
and I say that with feeling given my own personal age. Um, and I just wonder how well you think we understand that. Um, so I, my research interest is immunology. And so it's just easy to say immune senescence, but I'm not sure if we fully understand uh, why age was such a risk factor. I'd be interested in your comments because I know it's in a sense your special subject. I think it is a very interesting question. And I think that there may be um, many factors that interrelate. And one of the factors that um, is key is that um, individuals who are older often are, are individuals who are frailer. And those people are particularly at risk. And we see that definitely across the UK um, using having used the clinical frailty scale um, across the UK now um, in, uh, in hospital settings, that it's not necessarily older adults who are fit who are high at risk, it's older adults who are frail. And what, what does frailty really mean? Well, in a way, it is a reduced physiological reserve on many parameters. Um, so it could be physiological in terms of the immune system, as you rightly put, but also in terms of the renal system. And you know, we've talked, we, we've heard from Ian about um, how fluid management is really key. Also, the cardiovascular system, the ability to cope with that septic episode, and the the, the sensi sens sensitivity of the brain and other organs to damage. Obviously, clearly, the lungs as well are affected in older people. So I think it's it's a multi-system phenomenon. But remember, it's not just about age, actually. It's actually more about frailty, and that we have to um, be very clear about. Um, and in fact, in our studies, when we've looked at frailty, we've seen a much greater relationship to COVID outcomes than we have with age on its own. Okay, go, good, thank you. That's a point very well made. So we'll keep exercising. Um, so I'm going to give a quiz question now to Ian that's come from an anonymous questioner because they've noticed uh, Ian's bike in the background. Now, actually, Ian always has had, for as long as I've known him, a Brompton in the background. But the question is whether one of the dividends, uh, perhaps, of COVID uh, has been or will be uh, a change in our behaviours in relation to commuting uh, and use of public transport. Ian, any, any reflections on uh, that aspect specifically, but in general, how you think COVID might be having lasting effects on society? Um, thank you, uh, Robert. Um, uh, and there are a number, uh, and there will be a number of persistent effects on society. I mean, certainly we've seen here um, uh, a lower number um, of colleagues necessarily working um, at the hospitals. We've got something like 18,000 um, employees, a lot of our uh, support colleagues um, are working from home um, and certainly the buildings are less full uh, than they would have otherwise been and we've seen that reflected um, in uh, commuting to trains, buses, other um, forms of transport much uh, less full than they were. We've also seen KCL, uh, GSTT, KCH and our colleagues at Slough Board have been strong uh, proponents, strong advocates of sustainable um, uh, organization sustainable from an environmental perspective um, and certainly um, uh, many of us now cycle between the various sites of our um, organization across the sites of KHP um, uh, and I would certainly recommend it and some of the um, cycle lanes that we're now seeing in London do give us an opportunity I think uh, to contribute to uh, our ambitions around climate change um, I think um, how society develops, Robert, how those working practices um, continue. I miss the water cooler moment, um, and we must allow somehow those spontaneous creative um, environments to remain so that we can have those conversations that we otherwise wouldn't have had on Teams. Uh, I think there's a particular, lastly I'll say, I think there is a particular psychology um, uh, effect of working on Teams. It, it, I think we miss some of the uh, non-verbal uh, uh, cues that we otherwise would get if we were together. Uh, and we've got to find ways of ensuring that people feel emotionally bonded to the organization, even if they're, you're working virtually. Yeah, no, no, I think I, I would accept that last point you make. I, 
I think this is going to be bad for gossip. Um, but I, I think, I mean, I do reflect, I mean, the number of meetings that I've organized when people have to trek from Denmark Hill to Guy's or vice versa for a one hour meeting. It's an hour traveling both directions, roughly speaking. So it's three hours out at least for a one hour meeting. And I think that's just indefensible. Uh, I felt that for a long time, but I feel it very acutely now. So I'm sure our patterns of behavior will uh, indeed change. Now there's a number of other questions coming in. There's another one um, for Claire from uh, Stephen Chalicum, uh, who's actually expanding my vocabulary as usual. So he says, for Claire, given that primary sites of replication, nose and mouth, what's the correlation between anosmia and dysgeusia? Um, if you want to know what dysgeusia is, I'll ask Stephen, but maybe you know already. It's, um, no, I do know. It's uh, the loss of taste. Um, and interestingly, in the app, we don't distinguish with them between them because actually it's quite difficult to explain to the general public what the real, what the sort of medical difference is. Of course, taste um, officially relies on um, the, the, I think, four senses, bitterness, saltiness, um, sourness, and we, I forget the last one, um, which are senses on the tongue, whereas the sense of smell is what the nose does. Um, but in fact, what most people refer to as taste um, is in fact a combination of, of smell predominantly and taste. So if you ask the general public um, you know, about taste, you're going to get responses about smell. Um, uh, having said that, um, there are reports that sense of taste is also affected as well as smell, but it appears that smell is more specific and, and more common. Yeah, thanks. Um, there's a couple of surgically orientated uh, questions coming in, um, and maybe for Ian, something about the COVID-19 protective measures for elective surgery patients. As we yeah, thanks, and um, we um, uh, do have protective pathways. The uh, at the moment we are testing um, uh, surgical patients preoperatively, um, uh, and uh, we're trying to get to a, a position where, particularly because patients come to us, our organisations from from across the country, really finding ways that we can test those patients um, uh, uh, using distant testing, so they don't have to come here. But normally patients are tested 48 hours beforehand and we have a negative result before admission. Um, there was quite a lot around shielding for patients and their families um, uh, in the uh, early stages of the restart of elective surgical pathways. Actually, that's fairly counterproductive, really, because um, for many um, of our patients, they weren't able and their families to isolate for 14 days. Um, before um, admission to surgery. So now we've managed to work with uh, national bodies to change those rules. And many of the leading thinkers, Nick Price um, uh, and others on infection prevention and control come from uh, KCL organizations. So uh, we've managed to lead some of those national conversations around safety. Um, uh, so uh, we are looking, I noticed another question in the chat room, uh, Robert, around uh, would we consider um, COVID uh, negative sites? And we do have opportunities here uh, within um, uh, KHP perhaps to uh, use the Guy's campus uh, for certainly COVID light or COVID negative um, surgical pathways. So important that we can keep going with the uh, urgent surgery, um, perhaps even for KCH as well as with the Guy's campus. And we did that very successfully, particularly with cancer uh, and other urgent surgery during the first wave, uh, while retaining our um, sites that are particularly facing the ED uh, that Claire is, is perhaps looking after, those patients more at St. Thomas's or more at KCH, and also with our partners at Lewisham. Um, so absolutely, Robert, um, thinking about um, separation of pathways is very important. Terrific. So back to Claire, this is an epidemiological type question. Um, there's much talk about a north-south divide and, and you, you know, your map is quite stark. So what insights do you think we have as to uh, where the clusters are happening and why? Well, I think this is a very interesting question. I think it's all, uh, on all our minds. Um, and in fact, uh, I think Brian Sutton has also put a question around over dispersion. And I think um, th th there's, a, there's a way of modeling that called K. And I think look out for K in the future uh, months because it may replace R as our metric 
um, of understanding how, th how, how disease spreads. So basically, if you think of R, it's really an average amount of people that an individual infects. Um, but the, what we see with um, particularly the SARS and MERS viruses is that um, it, some people, you know, most people don't spread it very much. Some people spread it very much indeed. And that can be measured by this other metric called K or over dispersion. So we're going to be really looking at actually how we can use do that on a regional basis within the app. And I think it will be very illuminating to this question because it may be that there are super spreading events still happening um, uh, in some areas and not in others. But going back to North-South divide, I think we've got to remember that the experience of coronavirus in um, the first wave was predominantly a London and Birmingham issue. And so, and, and so from our studies within Twins UK uh, um, uh, participants and ac ac across um, the local area around London, who we went out to visit um, short, shortly after April and then again in July, versus when we've done a national sweep with lateral flow devices that some people have been mentioning um, uh, across the whole of the UK. We see London has a good 12%, sometimes some areas even higher, um, uh, antibody positivity to coronavirus, whereas nationally it's much less. It's more like 6% overall and much less further north at that time point in, in August. So that may be why we're seeing a new wave coming up. In a sense, maybe it's their first wave. Um, uh, but more on K later to really unpick whether there are social differences between the north and the south, which might account for it. Yeah, I mean, I think what's going to prove very interesting in the longer term is international comparisons and um, behaviours. Um, and so I've recently come back from spending a little time in Italy, and, and I know Italy well because I'm married to an Italian. And one tends to think of Italy as a rather anarchic, rule-breaking, freewheeling, uh, do-as-you-please country. But uh, if you've been following things, Italy's done extremely well overall in this pandemic. And one has to wonder whether it was because of the extreme scare they had at the beginning, if you remember what it was like in northern Italy when their health system actually got overwhelmed. I mean, scenes that fortunately we never saw here, um, thanks to the kind of planning that Ian's described in our health service. Um, so actually what you see in Italy, even in southern Italy, is really remarkably disciplined behaviours, which is not typically culturally characteristic, but I think may be an important factor in why uh, Italy has kept the lid on things, but uh, no doubt those things will come out over time. Mm -hmm. um, let me see if I can take one other question before moving towards, uh, yeah. So there's a question, a very important question, I think it's Stephen again, around uh, testing. So much of the problem about testing um, has been logistical, I would say. Um, and uh, if it was possible to test saliva and, and if saliva gave a sufficiently uh, sensitive answer compared to this quite invasive swabbing that needs to be done, that would be extremely helpful. Um, so any data from either of you that you know on uh, whether saliva will come out as a, a winner? Uh, Claire? Um, <laughs> I was going to say, Ian? Yeah, um, uh, so, so definitely, um, saliva appears to have um, coronavirus quite well detectable, um, is what I would say. I, I, I know of a number of um, places that are looking very closely at saliva. Um, one of the problems actually has been is that as we've been developing testing in saliva, the rates in the population were so low, we couldn't find enough positive samples to actually pro prove it on. Um, uh, but I think that um, certainly there are groups doing lateral flow, uh, sorry, not lateral flow, doing um, other methods such as LAMP on, uh, on saliva and showing quite interesting results. So yes, it's going to be a good way forward. It may be a slightly different approach though, maybe with a slightly less sensitivity, but greater um, overall ability to cover a population. So in a sense, maybe um, Ian and his colleagues in the, in the trust will still be using PCR level le uh, driven techniques and maybe involving swabbing, but in other, in other sort of areas, the saliva and with a slightly lower sensitivity, but higher coverage might be good. Uh, and, and certainly, Claire, I uh, agree with that. Um, I mean, 
Uh, certainly, rapid testing uh, technology is, is needed, reliable rapid testing technology, rapid antigen testing. Uh, uh, I saw the first case report, um, Steve Jalakum, the other day of um, uh, uh, cerebrospinal fluid leak associated with relatively aggressive uh, nasopharyngeal swabbing. So let's hope there's a, there's a rapid antigen um, test soon. Uh, the last thing I was going to say from, from, um, from here, Robert, um, uh, was very pleased that um, uh, KCL associated organizations um, are deeply involved in the vaccine studies because I guess one uh, future uh, that we have um, is a world where uh, we will be back to a, a, a different type of normal, but one helped by vaccines. Um, and we are very active in the vaccine studies. Guy and St. Thomas's uh, will be the population organization to uh, vaccinate Southeast London. Um, uh, so we look forward, hopefully, to uh, a world at least partially protected uh, from COVID-19. Uh, uh, over to you, Robert. Yeah, no, well, I think that's perhaps quite a nice note to draw this discussion to a close on. I'm cautiously optimistic on the vaccine front. Um, I think the Oxford vaccine does seem to be going quite well. The Moderna vaccine is probably the most far advanced in the US and that's also quite promising. I'm chairing the Imperial Vaccine Steering Committee, which is a little bit lagging behind, but I think one way or another, the chances of having a vaccine that will at least give some protection to a significant fraction of the population, uh, I think it's really within, within reach. And that, as you say, Ian, will change the situation significantly for the better. Mm. So as we as we draw to a close, and, and this is actually picking up on one of the other questions in the Q&A bar, um, when I talked about COVID, I, I've often observed that there are at least four health impacts of this pandemic. The first and the immediate focus, of course, has been the direct effects of the virus, and we've uh, heard about that today, um, and unfortunately there's more of that to come, and of course that should be the immediate focus. But I think there are three other consequences that are going to be also very important. We touched on one, which is the displacement of routine clinical activity that this has inevitably caused. And it's absolutely crucial that we manage uh, whatever ripples go on through the winter in the most intelligent way possible in the way Ian's described with segregating spaces in our healthcare organizations and the like. Uh, but that, unfortunately, I think will have a long-term impact on cancer outcomes and uh, things that need screening for, and well as well as other um, uh, medical conditions. The third horrible impact is the effect of an economic downturn. So if this virus does anything, it exaggerates inequalities. And uh, you've heard about some of that from Claire. And health uh, economic downturns always uh, exaggerate health inequalities. And so I think we need to work doubly hard um, to protect the, those at the bottom of the pile. Um, and then the fourth uh, impact is, is mental health. But I would add to mental health the long COVID thing that Claire also mentioned. But I think the mental health impacts of this are substantial on staff who really were stressed at the front line, on elderly people who are isolated, young people who are socially deprived, uh, and then um, the long COVID impact, some of which will, will be mental health. So I think there's an awful lot um, that we have yet to discover, many challenges to address, but I think we're very fortunate to be working in the context we are with the colleagues that we have. And you've heard about some of the really impressive uh, stuff that's been going on in the last few months. So can I end by, by thanking Claire and Ian again for great talks and the great work they're doing. Can I thank Barry for organizing this? Um, and then just to flag that the next webinar will be on Tuesday the 13th of October. Uh, and there you'll hear from Ewan Furley and Kenji Shibua uh, about the national governance of a global pandemic. Uh, and that will be under the chairmanship of my great grandfather as vice principal of King's, Cyril Chantlow, who was the first ever uh, vice principal. Uh, so that's one to look out for. So thank you all very much for being here. And thanks again to uh, Claire and Ian. And I wish you a good evening. <laughs>